Welcome to a new edition of the Neon Jazz Interview Series with Denmark-based jazz vocalist and bassist Kristen Korb. In 2021, this Montana-born musician released a double CD entitled What If... Why not? Reflecting on the pop and jazz sides of her personality. On What If, she departs from the great American songbook tradition and dives deep into the exploration of pop tunes that burst with their trademark exuberance and inspired arrangements. She is one of those artists who make you forget that she is playing the bass when you hear her voice. She has a storied and interesting path that will actually make its way to Kansas City on March 26, 2023 at the brand new Uptown Lounge. We get into quite a bit in this interview. Enjoy. Where are you located? I am in just outside of Copenhagen, Denmark. Wow, and you're going to be in Kansas City soon. I am. I am so excited. It is really going to be a blast. That's great, yeah. In Kansas City, it's been really good to see clubs opening up, and that location used to be an old kind of like rock and roll bar. And right before the pandemic happened, there was a little fire, and it got extensive like water damage and smoke damage, and it was kind of a bummer. It used to be called Davies Uptown. Years ago, when I worked like in my twenties, when I worked in corporate America, I used to go there with friends to drink after work, and. When I left that job, I had a map of a parcel of land that I owned on the moon. It was kind of a gag, but they had that map of my property hanging up behind the bar. It was a real claim to fame at that point in my life. Oh, I love it. <laughs> so it was cool. It was awesome. <laughs> I want to kind of peel back the layers here as we kind of lead to this Kansas City trip. But first and foremost, thank you for taking a minute out and I want to know before we get into your life, you know, we've gone through quite a thing with COVID for the last three years as a musician. How did you survive it and how has it changed the way that you lead and conduct business now? Well, I mean, I've been in the business for quite a while. So I think, you know, one of the things that, um, especially when I was a young musician, it seems like, you know, when you're trying to just get your stuff established in the world and, and doing your thing and everything. The, your biggest fear is, what if I'm not working? <laughs> you know, there's that, yeah. well, what if I'm missing a day or if there's, you know, oh my gosh, it's a Friday night and I'm not playing a job. You know, there would be like the freak out. And then after, you know, 20 years of that, then it's like, uh, you know, I'm, I'm working. I have nothing to worry about. I don't need to worry about this. And then the, you know, I think, every working musician's fear happened, you know, it all shut down. And I think considering that I was here in Denmark and um, married and, you know, with my husband and um, I, I feel like I, I weathered it relatively well. I think there's a lot of stuff I notice now that I feel like it really messed with my head um, in that uh, just, you know, sense of time and when did I do things and when have things happened and did I do that song? Um, there have been some real weird things for me just personally thinking about like memory and um, sometimes drive could be a little bit of an issue. You know, if you're used to practicing for the gig, um, that can always be bring a little bit like, well, what am I, what am I playing for? Who am I playing for? Um, it kind of shifts that perspective a little bit and brings it back into, oh yeah, that's why I play music because I enjoy it. Um, so I think it gave me time to kind of just dig deeper into things rather than just be practicing for the gig. Um, I, I really enjoyed the forest here. We live right across the street from a forest. And so it was so nice to be able to just um, you know, we were lucky, unlike other people in other places. I mean, we, we were encouraged. We, we went out in the forest every day. So, I mean, we were in nature. We, you know, um, we had a beautiful summer here. So that was really nice. Um, creatively, we made a cookbook. <laughs> I, I have two bonus kids that had just before everything locked down, they ended up in their own apartments and we had talked about making a cookbook for them so they could have recipes that they grew up with, you know, in our household. And um, it gave us time to do that. So I actually learned the software and how to make books that Adobe InDesign and I did 
I don't know how many online tutorials and, and everything. And, and so we made a, a really professional looking cookbook with just the two of us, um, working on pictures and, you know, trying recipes. Cause you know, what else are you going to do? We didn't necessarily go down the, the sourdough starter line, but we, uh, <laughs> <laughs> we worked on, you know, making sure the recipes were as we wanted them for the kids and, then it ended up being something we could share with, with more people since people were buying, you know, cookbooks rather than um, CDs. You know, we had our home studio, which we had started a little bit before the lockdown. And then once everything locked down, we, you know, finished ordering what we needed and we recorded a double disc as well. So, I mean, we were, we were productive, I think, with the time. Yeah, it sounds like it. You know what's interesting to give proper context to that question from my perspective, since we're together interviewing right now on Valentine's Day 2023, my initial correspondence to you was on May 13th, 2020. <laughs> and it, it, but th this, is, this is the interesting thing about that. I remember I had a decision to make on my end when this all happened, like, what am I going to do? Because I was in shock. There was a lot that went into it, obviously, for all of us. And I decided slowly as time went on that I was going to interview as many people as I possibly could. I sent out so many requests. I have a stepdaughter who's now 17, my son who's 18, and I would put the interviews on speaker and they would listen to me interview the jazz community. And overwhelmingly, the voices were strong and positive and good. But I remember you were a part of a huge amount of requests that I sent out. And, you know, at that time, I was sending requests out to people like Diane Schur and others that typically would not be available. But because of the shutdown, people were at home. So that's the thing that's so interesting about us talking right now, which literally almost three years ago that we had reached out. <laughs> and, and from my perspective, I am so relieved to be able to have a different light that I get to interview musicians in because that time period, as much as there is strength and resolve and all of those really integrity fueled feelings that went into, you know, the musicians and the jazz community, it was really heartbreaking too, because nothing was happening and no one knew when it was going to come back. I mean, it was heartbreaking for everybody on the planet, but I think being as close to that community as I've been, it was very strange. So it's really good, actually. That's in a long roundabout story way. That's the thing that's so triumphant about us being able to talk now. It's like you have material out. The world's opening up more and more. You're coming to Kansas City. This is a great time for us to talk. Yeah. I'm, and I apologize for not getting back to you. I mean, I think, you know, while I was doing, trying to keep myself active, I think there were certain parts of me that just kind of shut down. And, you know, like checking email was kind of one of those things. So now I've been going yeah. through my emails and just kind of going like, what did I miss? What did I, because I just, I don't know. There was just certain things that I, I just didn't follow through with things because it was like, well, I don't know what, you know, I don't know if I should be booking anything or responding to anything because everything shut down. And then the, the calls that I did make were like the people that were on my newsletter list. I actually started singing to them on their birthdays just because, you know, it's a jazz community and there are a lot of older people in our in our fan base. And so I would call and do FaceTime calls as birthday um, greetings um, just to make sure people were OK. That's wonderful. Yeah. And, and this is such a happy surprise. I'm glad you didn't check your email because this was a total surprise. And I had to, I had to kind of sh <laughs> like ru rub my eyes and I was like, wait, did I send that in 2020? So it was really cool. Um, and then the fact that you're coming to a brand new club in Kansas City. But before we get there, I want to know, where were you born and raised? How did this jazz journey, the seed, begin for you? Well, I was born in Billings, Montana. And... Um, not a big center of jazz, um, but really good, you know, music in the public schools, really great uh, public education. And when I was in kindergarten, we moved to Boise, Idaho, another place one would not normally think of as a hot spot for jazz. Um, but when I went into junior high, the cool kids were in the vocal jazz ensemble. And um, I remember vividly 
them coming to our elementary school with the other, some of the other music groups from East Junior High. And, you know, the band played and I was like, oh, whatever. And, and I was into music as a kid and I did violin in fourth grade, but I, I just didn't really like the violin so much and didn't really vibe with the orchestra director. And then, you know, I heard the orchestra play and I was like, oh, whatever. And then the East Junior High Mad Jazz Singers came up. And they were all singing and smiling and moving to the music and they had their own microphones and the girls had cool dresses on and the guys had nice ties instead of, you know, the bow tie thing from the other groups. And they had solos and a student band. And I was like, I want to be in the band. And I had been playing guitar up to that point and I didn't even realize it was a bass guitar in the band, but I had my guitar teacher reach out to the choir director and say, you know, I've got a student coming your way next year. Um, she wants to play in the vocal jazz ensemble. What does she need to do to get ready? And he was like, well, she's not going to play guitar because that's not what we want in the band. We want a, you know, an electric bass. I was like, whatever. I don't care. I just want to be in the band. So um, I started learning the bottom, you know, thinking more in a bass sense on the bottom four strings of my guitar. And then my lovely parents brought me into school every day, like at 7 a.m. It was insane um, because I just would go straight to the choir room and pick up the electric bass and figure it out. Um, and of course, uh, my wonderful director, Rob Newburn, had music playing in the room all the time. So there was, you know, Manhattan Transfer and Ella and Sarah and Carmen McRae and all this wonderful music and real books on the piano. So it was like, it was really ripe for students that were inquisitive and asking way too many questions. And um, he eventually took me and four other students to uh, the Frank DeMuro Sound Station Jazz Camp when uh, at the end of my seventh grade year. And it was at that camp in Seattle, Washington, where I was like, this is what I'm gonna do for the rest of my life. And it made my parents a little nervous. <laughs> it was like a jazz musician. Yes. Yeah. That's wonderful. Yeah. You know, and I always, now that I'm, I, I've been in, I've loved jazz for as long as I have. It's kind of like when people would get a tattoo and they were like, you know, that just means it opens the door to more and more and more. It's like an addiction. It's like a healthy addiction, like cigarettes. Like once you get in there and you get that feeling, you never want to let it go. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I remember that for me, kind of blue was it. I was on a trip, had an old CD player flying to Seattle, never heard that sound before. And it was pure transport to another place that I didn't know existed in any realm of life. So, um, yeah. yeah, it's, it's amazing. So the one thing I got to ask you, and you can kind of peel back the layers of the timeline how does a girl from Montana end up in, in Denmark? <laughs> the short answer, love. Um, All right. I was playing, yeah, I was playing the jazz. It's Valentine's and Day. <laughs> I know, it's awesome. It's a love story. It really is. Yeah. Um, I was playing on the jazz cruise in, was it 2009? Yeah, in nine. And... Um, or was it 10? No, nine. It was nine because it was November. And then they switched the cruise to another part of the year. So yeah, it was in November of nine and I was playing as an all-star. So the jazz cruise itself has a bunch of different bands that are already, you know, pre-organized bands. And then they also have a group of, of musicians that are, um, they put together in various constellations and they call me the all-stars and they play a few sets during the week. And I was playing the first, it was the Sunday night, first show in the big room. And um, there was a sound man there and I had been on the cruise before and I'd played every stage, but that one. So I had never met him before. Um, and I walked up there and, you know, it was, oh, Kristen, you know, welcome back to the jazz cruise. It's so great to see you again. We're really happy to have you here. And I'm thinking, 
I don't remember meeting this guy, but he had like all the notes. So he knew when I was there last and la la la. So it just being a smart aleck, he uh, got down on bended knee and said, may I clip this microphone on your base? And I thought that was the worst pickup line I'd ever heard in my life, but he may. And, uh, but I was going to keep an eye on him. So, uh, we became friends during the cruise and, um, then, you know, later we ended up visiting each other back and forth between Los Angeles, where I was living and Copenhagen. And after a year and a half, we decided to get married. You know, what's interesting about Denmark, and I know that there's, there's a real connection to that city because a lot of, you know, a lot of African-Americans would go to Europe and Denmark in particular to escape the racism and the things that would marginalize them as humans here. And they would get heralded and treated as though they should have been treated here. And that's what I find very interesting about Denmark and the history. And it's kind of like Kansas City. There's a, there's a palatable history and lore that goes in to locations that they're cradles of jazz. What does it feel like yeah. there? What, is, what did it mean for you to be there? And what does it continually feel like? It's a great place. Um, I'm really thankful that the jazz family here is very diverse. Um, there is uh, a wide array of expressions of this music and the traditions that have come into it. Um, you know, on the one side, there's a, a big tradition of varying locations across the, around the country. It's a small country, so it only takes like, you know, seven hours to drive across. So in terms of like, when I think Copenhagen, I actually really think more of the entire country because, you know, you've, you've got to travel a lot here to, to, you know, play locally in a way. Um, but there are towns where they really are into the Dixieland tradition and they have, you know, older musicians, but also younger musicians playing that music. There is a, a lot of experimentation. Um, there is a healthy, dose of people that uh, play the kind of the straight down the middle mainstream um, you know the stuff that resonates with me um, the it, once you start to know who the names are of the people you know when you first move over here it's it's a completely new world of names that i hadn't really known before like the only ones i really knew were um, jacob fisher wonderful guitar player and alex real who's kind of like Danish jazz royalty, wonderful drummer, has played in so many different configurations. Um, he's pretty legendary and amazing. Um, and then there's everything in between. So it's been really fun to, to get to know people and it takes time. Um, takes a little longer to really get to know people here than I thought it would take. Um, but there, once you know them, I mean, the family is warm and, um, very welcoming. And it's fun to talk to some of the older jazz fans because they have all those stories about Ben Webster and Dexter Gordon and Duke Jordan. And um, there's a saxophone player here, Bob Rockwell, who came over, I think his first tour was with the, um, the Thad Jones Mel Lewis big band. He's originally from Minneapolis, I think he's Minneapolis area. And he, lives in Copenhagen. So to be able to play with him, who's been here since, you know, the late seventies, um, and play some jobs with him and just have that familial language. Um, even though he's lived in Denmark for so many years, uh, it's nice to kind of have that feeling of home, even though, you know, my home is now in this other place. It's, it's a good place to be. And the jazz festival is astounding. It's, you know, like a hundred events a day for 10 days. So. That's wonderful. That's so good yeah. to hear. And I know that, you know, especially in Europe and in Denmark and other places, there's a level of reverence for jazz that doesn't exist anywhere else in the world. So it's always so reassuring. Um, so I'm curious with the myriad, you know, you've been in the jazz world for a while. There's a myriad of things that go into being a professional from recording to performing to teaching. There's all these aspects. But what drives you every day? What is it that you look forward to the most? in this process of being a professional musician? I mean, I think it kind of changes depending on the day, you know, what I want to focus on. 
Um, I mean, for me, really, I, and I think the thing that, you know, coming back out of the pandemic too, it's people, you know? I mean, it's those connections that we make with each other. And to me, like, music can do that in a way that nothing else does. And it, it heals, it brings people closer together. Um, and I think in the pandemic, then one of the things that I felt um, missing was that connection with other people and being able to come back on stage again with people, um, just to have that energy on the bandstand with musicians that I've missed and those conversations that I've missed, um, the energy of that mixed with the conversation that we have with the audience members, it has just been, it's like I can breathe again. Um, so it's like all those whatever technical things I would work on or music that I would write or all those other little kind of detail things in the music that I would do with my instrument. I think I do that stuff because I want to have better conversations, you know, with the audience and I want to have better conversations with them, with those people that I'm with on the bandstand. I think that's probably for me the thing that drives everything. So you've been down some pretty serious geographical roads, but you've also, you know, over all these years accumulated wisdom. So let's say you have a dream tonight. You run into the 20 year old version of yourself and you could give that version of you a piece of advice based on what you've lived and learned over these years. What would you tell your younger self? <laughs> Don't be so afraid. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it's... I think some of it, you know, just kind of depends on where you come from. But when you come from places where that maybe haven't been like the Jazz Central and then um, the thoughts that you have or the doubts that you have um, coming into a scene like this, you know, it's like, are you good enough? Are you good enough to be able to have a career in this or pay your rent and, um, and do the things that you want to do in the music instead of being so afraid of being good enough, be more joyful in the exploration and just trust that everything will work itself out. That would be my biggest advice to myself. So let's say we get off the phone and a time machine pulls up in front of your house and you could go anywhere in jazz history and see someone live. Who are you going to go see? Where are you going? I <laughs> I would probably want to go hear Ella Fitzgerald's 40th birthday in Rome concert. I would want to be there for that. I just, that's one of my Wonderful. favorite recordings. And just to be in that airspace with Ella, any time with Ella would have been, you know, I think she's one of those artists that I never actually got to meet. And I would have loved to have gotten to know her as a person. What was the first live jazz show you ever saw that blew you away? I mean, that student one was the one that kind of got me into the whole thing of like, wow, I need to do this music. As far as like hearing professionals, Diane Schur had just recorded her Deedles album. This is early 80s, 83 maybe? Woo. Um, I can't remember what year that was. Anyway, she had just finished recording and I was at jazz camp and she had brought the tracks in with her um, on her cassette tape or whatever she had at that time and then sang along with the rhythm tracks for us students at camp. And I remember like, oh my gosh, I, oh, I need to get this. Um, so I kept hounding the record store for a year until the record came in. Um, so that was probably one of the performances that I, that made an impression on me. Um, as far as like a professional people, who did I hear? I, well, Gene Harris lived in Boise, but he didn't, he never, um, I never got to go hear him cause he played in bars and kids weren't allowed in the bars then. So I never got to go hear him there. Um, but I remember the first time I heard Ray Brown live, I could feel the air wow. move. That was really, that was when I was in grad school in this little club. And I was, you know, like five feet in front of the bandstand and you could almost feel the sweat off their brows. You know, it was with uh, Benny Green and Jeff Hamilton and 
that it went right through me. You know, what's fascinating about you saying, Diane, sure, that the level of serendipity and deja vu that goes into that answer is this. During COVID in 2020, I would say probably around May, I did interview her and she was alone in her house. Her cat kept coming up on the counter when she was getting coffee. And, you know, you could hear the cat meow. And, you know, we're all in this land of unknown. We didn't know how long this was going to go. And I remember, and this is the, this was probably the most, one of the most profound moments I ever spent with anybody ever on the phone in an interview situation. It was surreal. And I asked her what it was like going through this. And it had been two months. And she started telling me that this time that she was alone felt like after she was born, when she was alone in the hospital and no one was with her. And she was in a chamber so long that the oxygen was one of the reasons why she had a degenerative eye condition. But she just talked about that initial isolation that she felt as a human being on this planet was a little bit akin to what she was living through in the pandemic. And it was like, I was just floored. The fact that that corollary was made, but the fact that you just said that now and I literally sent that email to you in May of that year that I interviewed her is just mind blowing to me. Um, <laughs> truly. Yeah. So That's when you, wild. so yeah, it's wild. So let me ask you this. Everyone out there has a perception of you, your family, your friends, your fans, but ultimately you live your life. You have a perception of yourself. Who do you think you are? <laughs> This is a therapy question. I'm a legend in my own mind. No. Um, All right. I love it. (laughs) I love it. Oh, wow. I'm, I'm a lot of things. I'm a wife. I'm a sister. I'm a, a bonus mom. I'm a friend. I'm an auntie. Um, I mean, music is, is a very big part of me, but I think it's just, I use the music to express who I am as a human being. So I think to call myself a musician, I don't know. I don't, I don't wow. I don't know. I mean, you, I always think I of think myself as human things first. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think you I absolutely uh, hit it on the head. So, Kristen, the other thing that's fascinating about us connecting is that you're coming all the way from Denmark to Kansas City to our very newest club, the Uptown Lounge. Talk to me a little bit about how this trip was orchestrated, when you'll be here, how people can come see you, that kind of thing. It's going to be 6 p.m. on Sunday, March 26th. And um, it's, it's going to be so much fun. I'm really, really looking forward to it. Um, it all kind of sprouted out of a, co- well, a couple of different conversations. Um, I had an online community. I just closed it up because I'm getting too much, you know, back out on the road again. But um, I had a community for uh, adult lifelong learners and it mostly bass players called K Nation. And one of my members lives in Kansas City. And she's been like, Kristen, we need you to come to Kansas City and do workshops. And I know Johnny Hamill, who has a wonderful bass studio there. Um, He does really great work with students. Um, And um, I've been to Kansas City before, but it's been a very, very long time. and I've been in kind of like off again, on again conversations with David Bassey, wonderful drummer, singer, um, radio personality as well. And when I was putting this tour together, um, I talked to Christina and we figured, well, I could do the workshop on Monday and then I'd be flying from Arizona. So talking with David, he, he was very instrumental in helping put me together with um, Alan over at the Upton Lo- Uptown Lounge. And so talking with Alan, we got it worked out. So I'm, I'm really like just flying in literally Sunday morning from Phoenix 
and then playing the concert that night. So uh, people can get their tickets through Eventbrite or through the website for Uptown Lounge. And um, if we sell out, because it's a small room, um, if we sell out the six o'clock show, we might add a second show. So but we'd like to fill up that first one. That's wonderful. So. I, I liter literally seconds before we spoke, uh, I write for Jam Magazine and work with David. I just emailed him about next month. It's wild. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, he's so. wonderful. He's really, he's a guy that gets stuff done, man. I really yeah, he appreciate does. all that he's done. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, he's hugely instrumental in Kansas City. Uh, Kristen, thank you for opening up. Thanks for getting back with me. Um, I I'm glad it did take this long for the coincidences of this interview. So thank you very much, and uh, have a great trip to Can have a great trip to Kansas City, um, and good luck with everything. Thank you, and I hope we get to meet while I'm in town. Thanks for listening and tuning in to another Neon Jazz interview, where we give you a bit of insight into the finest players and minds in Montana, Denmark, Kansas City, and spots all over the world giving fans all that jazz. Thanks to Kristen for her time, music, and energy. If you want to hear more interviews, you can find Neon Jazz interviews at Spotify or Apple Podcasts. Subscribe to us at YouTube, and for everything Neon Jazz, go to the neonjazz.blogspot.com. Until next time, enjoy the jazz, my friends. Neon Jazz.